I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're talking global connections today uh, with Rupa Mati Khandekar. We talk about uh, some of the really interesting details of Indian economy, the Indian economy, how it's developed, what it's like today, and where it's going. This is an ongoing conversation, but there's so much material. Welcome to the show, Rupa Mati. Always nice to see you. Aloha, Jay, and always my pleasure to be with you. So let's so, let's uh, continue our conversation about the Indian economy. I, I want to add, and I don't know the implications, um, that Modi is coming, Ramdra Modi is coming to the United States to meet with Joe Biden next month. And of course, that's good, you know, because we want to we want to cultivate the better and better relationship with India. Um, it is the largest democracy in the world. It is going places. It, it has all these great prospects we can talk about. Um, and it's very important the United States stay close to India. Uh, don't you agree? Yeah, Jay, looking forward to this visit. I think it will be a big step in U.S.-India relations, uh, especially now when you see, um, you know, um, India coming up on the economic front. Um, Biden also pleasing the Indian diaspora because elections are coming uh, across. You remember last time uh, Trump was trying to please the Indian diaspora. It's a big voting bank and one of the biggest lobbies uh, in the U.S., so uh, having Modi come over the jingoism uh, helps electoral uh, process, isn't it? Yeah, jingoism. I hadn't heard that term <laughs> <laughs> in a while. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> well, good. I mean, you know, would you please speak to the Indians you know and tell them how to vote? That would be helpful. You're the political analyst here. You can give them some wisdom. Yeah, uh, I, it's very important, and I will too. So anyway, uh, the G20 is also meeting in India right around the same time. I don't know how uh, Mr. Modi is going to be in two places at once, but um, hey, uh, I'm sure he can work out a schedule. What happens at the G20 and what does it mean to India? Uh, G20 presidency that India has got this year is one of the highlights of Indian politics. It's been highlighted as uh, uh, one of the key uh, highlights because uh, uh, Jay, it is portrayed as India coming onto the big stage or the global stage. And uh, Mr. Modi has made sure that uh, the G20 uh, is also held in the state of Jammu and Kashmir to show that it's an integral part of India. So we had the SCO also meetings uh, happening in India. So this is a busy year for the political uh, agenda. And uh, you see uh, big players coming. Uh, I think there was a. a there was talk of uh, even Putin coming uh, to India, but I don't think it will happen for the November one. So now June is the visit of Modi to US. November, September, November, uh, September, October will be the G20 in India. So that's how he's going to uh, balance that out. Okay, well, because you know, these are the in diplomatic meetings, international meetings next year to 2024, US and India both go for elections. Hmm. That'll be. How, how does Modi stand? It's. It will be his third uh, term that he will seek Pan India elections, and uh, you see, there's a very big portrayal of Modi in a negative manner outside because the Indian economy has grown fivefold under his uh, tenure. But now you have to portray a negative image to bring down this man because his popularity is. Pan India, and the way he handles uh, uh, drastic situations uh, or like COVID and you know uh, emergency situations like a Pakistan attacking India, these are very noteworthy in his tenure. So when you see that uh, he has to uh, uh, endure another election, but I feel this election, whatever he has promised, he has delivered. Now this election is being portrayed as a religious divide, which is not. I mean, a government is voted on the basis of its performance. You can you can uh, highlight the communal uh, divisions, but not to such an extent that it will affect the outcome. That's, That's very troubling. Why? Why he doesn't need that? He doesn't need to do a divisive uh, campaign on religion. He's not it? that. The media does it. Jay, hmm. the international media, uh, uh, Washington Post in particular, these uh, papers, New York, New York Times. They portray a very negative image of uh, 
Mr. Modi, there was a gangster, a literal gangster who had killed millions of people, uh, hundreds of people, exaggerating that. But uh, he was termed as a lawmaker being shot dead. He was not put, uh, it was not reported as a gangster, uh, Akil, uh, Atik. So uh, he was, it was uh, biased that it was a religious bias that was uh, brought in. It was a lawmaker. He was, he served a term in the legislature, but that doesn't make him uh, wipe away his uh, gangster tactics. So uh, he was uh, in a gang war, he was uh, murdered. That didn't mean that the Western media has to portray that a lawmaker has been shot dead. So, you know, people who don't know about it will think that, oh, Mr. Modi is having somebody shot dead. So that doesn't work. That The negative hmm. image, it doesn't work. Oh, gee, thanks for that. That's, that's uh, helpful to understand. It sounds like to me, Modi, um, Modi is and should be popular for his economic con contributions over the past few years. Because India has uh, emerged as a, an economic powerhouse, as well yes. as uh, the most popular or likely the most popular country in the world. It's the fifth largest economy, as we discussed before. And uh, right. some of that, at least some of that is due to Modi. I mean, before uh, India was, um, you know, uh, it had socialist roots. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, it just wasn't focused on capitalism. It wasn't focused on entrepreneurship. Um, but, um, you know, Back a decade or two ago, things changed, and Modi has carried that forward, and he has allowed and encouraged the development of entrepreneurship and acquisition of foreign companies. We can talk about that, and um, you know, and built India to the economic powerhouse it is today. That's impressive. And if I were a voter in India, um, I would vote for him on that basis. That's what I would do. He's been tough sometimes. You and I have talked about that. But I think that's a matter of focus. And for good leadership, you need focus, right? But I, but till the 1990s, we had license Raj. When globalization came on the global front, uh, India accepted it and had to let go of the tariffs, the bureaucratic barriers that were uh, you know, hampering international investment. And Mr. Modi's uh, tenure from 2014, why the economic growth has taken such a leap? Because he has brought in uh, infrastructure development, uh, tax benefits for the investors who come from abroad. You know, you have benefit of payments and, uh, uh, you know, uh, receiving your revenue. Uh, he has eased, ease of payments, what is called. He has done that, ease of doing business. That scale, India has climbed up during his tenure. And that is what is attracting foreign investors. Now, you see the entire, uh, from uh, 1970 onwards, China, uh, um, came onto the international scene as a manufacturing hub. But seeing the domestic uh, uh, constrictions and, you know, the global perception of China, manufacturers are no looking for an alternative to China. And what better than India? When Indian government offers you better facilities, any investor will go to China. Last time we spoke about how Apple has done business from April to December 2022 of uh, $250 billion. That make itself shows that investors are looking to India as a lucrative uh, uh, center for investment, for manufacturing. And when you invest in manufacture in India, you have a ready consumption market. That is what is uh, uh, helping. And Jay, everywhere they're talking that the quant uh, China especially counters India's population growth as saying that they believe it's not about quantity, it's about the quality of population. But you see, Jay, Indian uh, population is a market, middle class market, which helps these industries to work. It's a workforce which has potential to build the infrastructure of a country, a country which was considered as third world. I told you it's got poverty, it's got uh, underdevelopment, but it's the fastest uh, rate of poverty reduction also. So that means there is a progressive graph. You can't belittle the achievements of a country which has uh, come to the fifth spot. And on merit, indigenous. And so that's uh, when China terms it as just being quantity over quality, uh, they're making a big mistake. Well, yeah, I, you know, I think what you, you point out something that's absolutely true and true all the time. 
back in uh, 20 years ago, in, uh, China was very popular among uh, American investors, global investors, because it had so much prospect. It, you know, it was opening. It was opening and it was, you know, giving them opportunities that were very controlled opportunities and, and all that stuff about the wholly owned foreign entities and, and the, the Chinese had to be your partner and all this uh, and controlling your intellectual property. Um, but but even despite all that, uh, it was an attractive market because there were 1.234 billion people there. Uh, the right. problem the problem was that the government was kind of tough and the government right. civil rights have really been reduced and in some places disappeared and people get um, you know get taken away and and uh, there's a lot of a lot of state sponsored murders in China these days and yes. and so that's pretty scary to an investor or a company that uh, that wants to do business in China and then return you know uh, to uh, India India, a democracy, a representative government. India, you know, which has a much greater focus on civil rights and making life better tomorrow than life is today. Uh, um, a country that really cares about, uh, you know, a benign globalism, if you will, and about expansion yes. of entrepreneurial activities and encouragement of investors. So um, what's not to like? Um, you know, so I think people, companies, investors, who might have been um, focused on China 20 years ago, have turned our turning to India, which has got to be a factor in India's success as a global economic power. Am I right what I said? Absolutely. Point on, Jay. You see uh, what you said, like uh, the education system in India it has been uh, good enough for Indian origin uh, people to take over as CEOs of big companies today in the global market. You have the CEO of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Google. You know, we have so many people who have just come in and uh, heading big global institutions. So when uh, the there's a talk, there's a debate about how India should upgrade its education system, its value system, these people have come from the very uh, education system that has been in place for so many days. So that means something good is happening over there that we are able to churn out a diaspora, which also uh, repatriates uh, uh, money back to the country. And Jay, English speaking population is a big advantage over China. Like we spoke about last time, how they talk about the accents, different, different accents the Indians have. So that's a big thing that they do. Yeah. Well, you know, and I mean, uh, <clears throat> there, there are, um... There are some very wealthy people at the same time in India. India has uh, hundreds of billionaires. It has uh, thousands uh, of um, millionaires and uh, ultra high risk, high uh, ultra high net worth individuals. Um, so people are being successful. Companies are being successful. Uh, companies are acquiring companies elsewhere in the world. Lots of them. Um, including American companies, including European companies. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if it's Modi or maybe it's the whole country believes that they are a global economic power and should direct their efforts at becoming a greater global economic power. Um, and I think that feeds into this whole phenomenon that we're talking about, uh, where India is, um, you know, manufacturing, um, and it's acquiring industrial companies. Um, and it's, um, you know, the problem, you know, with China is you really got to be careful. They control you. Uh, with, with India, they don't control you so much. But there is a certain, what do you call it, the kind of morality that is imposed by a democracy. For example, um, cars are a big deal in, in India. And uh, Tata, Tata Motors, you know, sells cars all over the world. Um, Tata himself, uh, you know, has had connection with Hawaii, um, and uh, Tata has a lot of other related industries. Um, so, of course, um, high-end cars are a big item in the consumer economy that you talked about. Elon Musk tried last year to develop a, a factory or a sales office uh, in India to sell Tesla there. And um, that failed. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe he he pulled the plug. He's 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 very unpredictable. Um, but he's trying again this year. 
And it's not clear to me whether the uh, Indian government will uh, encourage him to come, or maybe they think he's really not a good bet. What have you heard about that? No, uh, about uh, Tata uh, first, uh, they, they placed an order for the Boeing, which would create 1 million jobs across 45 states in the U.S. So that was a big, uh, uh, big, big consignment that was given. And Elon Musk, J, uh, driverless in India, I think it's a bit difficult because come to India, see, there the are no rules. <laughs> Road <laughs> rules are very different. <laughs> if you can drive in India, you can drive anywhere in the world. So uh, I think driverless would get a little confused. AI would need a whole new concept to come in, <laughs> come into India. Yeah, yeah I saw I saw an article in the paper about how the airlines are interested in um, you know developing AI for everything and anything, which is mm -hmm. you know that's what I would do if I were an airline CEO, um, and I know you would do it too. Um, <clears throat> so what what you get out of that though is that India is strong on uh, tech. Technology Education, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology uh, up there in what's in Bangalore. I'm not sure where yeah. it is. Uh, yeah, my yes. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, fantastic uh, tech technology graduates, many of whom have left India and become technology executives around the world. So it just yes. shows you uh, the quality of technology education in India. And that really... Uh, it's, it, it rises, uh, all boats rise with that. So here we are, and it's obvious from the press everywhere that AI is the great you know, t phenomenon of our time. Um, it's gonna change the world. There was testimony yeah. in Congress just this week about it. Um, this guy, Sam Altman was up there talking about how government needs to regulate things like uh, open AI, chat, GBT. <clears throat> so you know, we have, we have a, we're in the revolution, if you will on technology and India is very well prepared and India recognizes its, you know, its extraordinary opportunities. What have you heard about that? Um, IITs, uh, Jay, uh, they work very, um, uh, they're meticulous in their preparation. Do you know the mm. supercomputer, which was a long time back, uh, it was developed in my home city, Pune. So you have this kind of uh, innovations which take place. And when you say AI, when you say um, uh, uh, this uh, technological advancements, even the SFX, uh, uh, you see the movies, when you see the credits, you will find Indian names in it. A lot of Indian names in all the big movies. So you see India is also developing as not only as a manufacturing hub, as a technological uh, center for uh, international uh, uh, you know, development, you know, you have these uh, small institutes also, which will bring in big contributions to uh, the world of AI. And it's, it's in the development stage. So everybody can contribute and it, it's never going to be exhausted. Like we say, every innovation will count till a point comes when we don't know what to do with it. So AI is uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, a realm which we don't know what will become. So what we right do now, know that the you know, Indian uh, tech, technology workforce is very strong, uh, yes. speaks English, has been coding for years, um, and recognizes, you know, in a flat world, uh, they recognize that they can do this. There's really no barrier. Once you get on the internet, you can build these large language models so easily. All you have to do is develop, you know, the approach, the tech approach to, I can see them becoming a leader. Of course, China wants to do the same thing, but China imposes political controls on, on its large language models, and it's different, and it's not, not yes. really, not really um, all that optimistic, uh, not, not that competitive. Um, but India can do that, and I project for you that within the next mm, five years, if not less, India will become a major force in AI, don't you think? Yeah, Jay, Silicon Valley, you see so many Indians, don't you? Uh, now the United Kingdom wants to uh, build a Silicon Valley of its own. China falls back, like you said, because of the language constraints. So India has the language, India has the workforce, India has the education, which it can back on and uh, uh, you know, you can, they can tap on this. They can uh, use this advantage for uh, their benefit. 
that's yeah. going to be one of the uh, you know we have a population of below 28 65% is below uh, 35 so uh, that's a huge uh, population which is educated english speaking technologically uh, sound and we have digital data so the atmosphere is right the implementation is going to need fine tuning that's what's going to happen so the question i put to you is whether this um, you know, fantastic possibility will happen in India and will attract people from around the world to go to India. I mean, you know, could go to India and enjoy the entrepreneurial reception you, know, you would get from government because that's, that's the way the Modi government works. It encourages entrepreneurship. Um, right. and, get, and, and get, for that matter, uh, you know, garner uh, uh, capital uh, there, including capital from the U.S. or is India more likely to send people, send its graduates from IIT everywhere? Um, it, it, isn't, it isn't only political, it's technological, you know, um, everywhere, and, um, and, have, and, and where they will contribute to a global effort and make money at the same time, including in, in Europe, which we know they are well-received in Europe, and the U.S., which we know they are well-received in U.S. Uh, Indian CEOs uh, populate the world of technology in the U.S., um, which direction is it going to go? Is it going to, is it going to be attracted to India or is it going to be exported from India? Uh, right, Jay. Jay, uh, going back to our first initial conversation, that G20, which is happening now, it's got different aspects to it. Like it's uh, G20 women, G20 civil, G20, um, uh, you know, you have uh, infrastructure, G20 uh, rural, like this. This year, uh, India's, India's presidency has brought about a new uh, concept known as Startup 20. So bringing about that you encourage entrepreneurship in such a way that the startups are uh, you know, given all the incentives that they need to begin and uh, prosper in the uh, environment that they need. So this kind of uh, advertisement of encouragement of and providing a bill, uh, funds, resources, and, you know, the environment to thrive uh, becomes a big point because you never know where a startup can succeed. And everything that we are seeing in today's modern world has been a startup at some point of time. It's an idea which has flourished. Even Elon Musk has ideas which flourish. So startup Encouragement is very important, and India and the, its presidency is giving this. Yeah, I want to add. Uh, I want to add an article I saw about Airtel. Airtel okay. is a, I guess that's a, a telecommunications company, Correct. and um, India is very strong in telecommunications. Uh, you know, here in Hawaii, we have the, um, uh, the telecommunications uh, conference every January, and they're always there. Um, they, you know, they command a lot of respect there for their technology and their global view of things. And so if you have Airtel and you have AI and you have uh, all these people, you know, who are tech savvy, um, you're really talking about communications with the world and communications yes. with the world. You know, is just, that is a, 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 an essential part and parcel of um, global economic expansion. Airtel is the. Um, Big time on AI. Airtel is committed to AI. That was recently uh, in, in one of the Indian newspapers I saw. So wh what I'm saying is um, telecommunications is key. Global telecommunications and telecation, telecommunications technology is key to all this, and it will accelerate. Do you agree? Yeah, Jay. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a good combination to have. Uh, you have this... Uh, broadband providers which give you data at such dirt cheap prices uh, Jay, that we have um, accessibility and like I told you the UP, uh, UPI system which is the payment you can do payments because you have access to the internet so uh, this technology which is reaching every every person's hand and uh, bringing when you can understand what is written when a person can read English when he can uh, uh, understand the signs that are taking place, any business will find it, uh, find this technological uh, acceptance very uh, becoming of uh, them to come and invest in India. I saw another so, article that said the Indian government, Modi, 
had set aside two billion dollars. That's a lot of bread um, to uh, attract laptop makers like Apple, Apple computers to Bangalore um, to build computers. So this is different, you know. In, in the past, a lot of Apple computers were built in China, and now Modi sees India as a manufacturing center uh, for uh, computer hardware as well as software. Um, this this is a, a, a bit of a pivot, isn't it? Um, because uh, India is certainly capable of building computers, but it hasn't built all that many. It hasn't really embraced that subject, that that industrial opportunity. Uh, is there a? Do you think there's a, a future there? Yeah, Jay. Uh, this uh, I told you, told you before that Apple has been has opened its first store in uh, Bombay, and they're paying around forty four point two million in rupees for the, as rent. So you see, if they don't have a lucrative uh, standing or investment, why would they invest so much money? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's uh, very, uh, it speaks a lot of how much Modi has been uh, giving these manufacturers a place where they can really thrive. We had mobiles which were being manufactured in India. And you know how he encourages it? When you ask a company, to come, Mercedes. There's a big, there's a story about this. There's a tidbit about this that Mercedes came in, and uh, they didn't know if the Indian population would buy a uh, Mercedes. So they decided to just uh, venture out into the market and uh, create a reiki and uh, see how many people would buy. And Jay, they had a waiting list of one year. So they had to understand that they have to put up a factory in India to be able to supply. The Mercedes that that much of a demand, mm. so uh, never under, underestimate the Indian population. They do go for a lot of spending. So the entire manufacturing of Mercedes started happening in different different centers in India. They were going to assemble and bring it in India, but when they saw such a big demand, they decided to set up a uh, manufacturing. Now laptops are uh, in every person's hand, and Jay, see the people, one point four billion. How many laptops can be sold? So that market is huge. That, that market itself attracts these investments. That market itself attracts these uh, businesses, foreign investors, in such a way that even if a 1.4 billion people, it's like uh, <laughs> how, many, how many European countries put together? So even if 30% of this population goes and buys laptops, your deal is done. So uh, yeah. it's a good uh, good lucrative thing. So this uh, economic um, success, which is extraordinary in our time, in our world, um, requires energy. Okay? And, um, you know, you, 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 the more energy, cheap energy you have, the more you can expand your economic base. Um, and, and that leads me to ask about the, the, the troubling, you know, uh, phenomenon uh, where India is buying Russian oil. You know, right now, Russian is uh, oil is a product of Putin, and Putin is a monster. And I don't, mm. history will not judge him kindly, and I don't. And none of yes. my friends do. Um, but, and, uh, so the question is, uh, and, and apparently, I did see some, some press about this, and actually, uh, India, and probably for reasons associated with its economic expansion, is buying more and more Russian oil uh, and gas. It's, it's, not, it's not just a flat line. It's an increasing line. Mm. Increasingly. Um, so and, and on the one hand, you know, this is helpful. I'm sure that Modi, if he were here today, he would say, I need this to you know, expand our economics, our economy. Um, but on the other hand, there's a geopolitical price to pay. Um, so yes. is this going to catch up with him? Uh, where is he going to be, you know, in terms of the, what do you call it, the moral, the moral dilemma? This is about the European sanctions, Jay. Uh, Europe is bypassing Russia and going to India. Now, India, out of, out of the blue, has become the biggest supplier of refined oil to uh, refined crude, refined petrol to Europe. How did that happen? Russia is supplying to India. India is refining it and sending 386,000 barrels a day to Europe. So Europe has just bypassed Russia and going through India. It's, India is playing a wire wire role in this. So uh, you see, uh, sanctions are imposed, but uh, Europe is getting its supply of oil 
through other channels. That is not right. When you stop uh, Russian crude, stop it completely in the market from coming out of Russia. Don't allow it to come through a channel and then reach you. You know, that would make a, if Russia, uh, Europe stops buying 386,000 barrels, it will hit uh, the countries. But because this is moving, you see there is talk of de-dollarization. There is talk of uh, um, replacement of the dollar after 70 years, 75 years, uh, uh, Jay, that uh, there is talk in the global market of replacing the dollar as a petrocurrency. There's a BRICS uh, currency which around 30 countries have accepted to uh, have payments. Russia and India decided to do a trade in the Indian rupees, but they don't know what to do with the Indian rupees. So the new payment system is happening in the global market, and uh, China and Russia are the engines behind this. India is a part of this, but China and Russia are wanting to jointly displace the United Nations, uh, United States, as the hegemon of the global liberal economic order. Now we live in a time of change, and there's so much more to discuss, Maria. Um, I look forward to our next show. We'll drill down on so many issues that have been raised. Thank you so much, Rupmani. Rupmani Kandakar, uh, helping us understand not only India, but the, India's effect uh, on the global community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jay. Always, always my pleasure. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.